name's Nancy Janes. I'm the owner and winemaker at Whitewater Hill Vineyards, and we've been making wine here for over 16 years now and growing grapes since 1998. Um, we do produce grapes for a lot of other wineries in the state, and then we make our own wines and have our tasting room here in Grand Junction. So we're excited to participate in this fall event, and um, we would hope that all of you would come and see us at some point in time if you get up our way. If you haven't already been here to see us, we make a lot of different wines. Um, we make dry whites, a dry rosé, dry reds, semi-sweets, and dessert wines. Kind of a little of everything. Um, my husband helps me out in the winery um, a lot, and then he grows the grapes during the summertime. So it's definitely teamwork, and we've been at it for a long time and have a fabulous time growing all 100% Colorado-grown grapes. So we're really proud of the fruit we're growing here in the valley and really proud of the wines that we're able to produce. We are currently open for tasting. We've been doing all of our tastings during the summertime outside on the pergola and we will try to do them outside as much as possible with some heaters and then if it's too cold you can still come inside and join us at our tasting bar. We are wearing masks and um, doing all the proper social distancing so we want to make sure you're comfortable to come and see us. Let me go through our wines a little bit to let you know what we have. We have some dry whites, a totally dry Riesling that's going to be like a Pinot Grigio, a couple of Chardonnays, unoaked and lightly oaked, our dry rosé of St. Vincent, which is a lovely crisp dry rosé. St. Vincent itself is a lot like a Sangiovese, a really lovely light soft wine. Um, Chamberson, another soft, easy drinking red, and then the more traditional reds, Merlot, Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc are all um, classic European varieties. And then Ethereal is a winemaker's reserve blend, another dry red. Rosé is lightly sweet, and then we get sweeter as we go down the row with Gewürztraminer and Riesling, some of the classic Alsatian grapes. Sweetheart Red's going to be like a um, sangria. It's actually a lovely semi-sweet red that's great with spicy food. Moscato um, has that wonderful kind of honeysuckle aroma and flavor. And then our dessert wines. Zero Below is going to be a um, almost ice wine style. We do make a true ice wine where the grapes are frozen by Mother Nature. We could have done that this year, except we didn't have any grapes to hang since we had a little bit of a small crop this year. And then Ruby Classico is going to be your classic port style. The wine that will be highlighted in this fall's event is going to be our Zero Below. And this is a dessert wine. I make it with Chardonnay. And the grapes are um, late harvested to the point where the grapes are almost turning into raisins. So you're going to have this extra beautiful sweetness, a little bit of earthiness to it. Um, it's going to be more like a golden raisin than it is like a Thompson Seedless, that beautiful extra ripe flavor. We then freeze the juice a little bit in the freezer after we press it off, which um, de-waters it, basically. We're freezing up water to leave the juice even sweeter. So this is going to be very much like an ice wine at a lot easier price point. Uh, lovely dessert wine. It goes beautifully with Palisade peaches. I love it with um, pound cake. Um, cheesecake is a beautiful pairing. Just a delightful dessert wine. I like to open up a bottle when I have some friends over and give everybody a small glass and it just adds an immense amount of cheer to any occasion. Can you everyone, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I think I'm unmuted. Great. So yeah. I think I covered pretty well um, what we're up to. Uh, we're, um, we've been here in the Grand Valley since 1998 and we still grow a lot of grapes for other wineries around the state, um, including some, we work with a lot of folks down in the um, West Elks area, which is a delight. Um, Garrett and I spend a lot of time on trains and Kaylin's dad, Steve, has been on there a lot doing tastings for AAA. So they're great friends and wonderful neighbors. We love um, being close by to them and, and sharing the industry with such fun folks. But um, yeah, we're, I've, I couldn't remember what all had been put in the video. Um, I put some of the labels that we make. We do make a lot of different styles of wines and something kind of for every palate. So we hope that you have come to see us at some point in the past or that you'll come and see us now that you've gotten a chance to uh, see what we're up to. So any questions before we go ahead and get into tasting? Nancy, I have a question. 
So you mentioned that the dessert wine, your wine that you make is almost, the grapes are almost like a raisin. So that must mean you must need so many more grapes to actually make your wine because you're not getting that liquid out of them. That's correct. For the zero below, the grapes are just starting to raisin, but a normal bin of Chardonnay grapes will weigh about 800 pounds. By the time we pick these grapes, it's about a month of extra hang time. So we've gone from um, about 23 to 24% sugar. Um, we measure that in something called BRICS, B-R-I-X. But by the time we pick them, this particular one came in at um, 35% sugar at harvest. So the bins weigh about 1,200 pounds instead of about 800 pounds. So we're losing 25 to 30% probably in desiccation as the grapes um, raisin slightly before we pick this. In the true ice wine, when we make that, um, the Riesling grapes are normally picked in October and the true ice wine is picked the usually gets cold enough, I have to pick and press it under 17 Fahrenheit. And that usually ends up being about the second week of December before we get that cold. And um, we lose 95% on that, that wine. That's a very challenging wine to make. Um, I haven't made an ice wine at this point since 2016. Um, I would have liked to have made one this year, but because we had a small crop and we had people that really wanted grapes, we didn't feel like we could justify losing 95% of a crop to make an ice wine when people really wanted those grapes. So um, we'll see how the Riesling's looking next year. Um, it's a fairly cold hardy variety and we may have, have Riesling around next year, but it's more likely that it's gonna be another year um, into 2022 before we can make a true ice wine again. So, so Nancy, um, we're eating a chocolate dessert here um, <laughs> by a local uh, baker, and um, it's it has taken me a while to warm up to sweet wines. I, I prefer dry wines, but I do appreciate uh, dessert wines. And I wonder if you could comment on the balance on this wine. It, it for me, it's very nice. It has a sweetness, but it still has an acidity. And exactly. the balance is very nice with it. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's one of the tricks with um, dessert wines is if you don't have good acid, the wine will be very heavy and very cloying. So you really put your finger right on it when you mentioned that it needed to have good acidity. And that will leave it with some brightness and some lightness that counteracts the heaviness of all the sugar and makes it a little more food friendly. Um, the recipe, chocolates is a challenging pairing for this wine because it's Chardonnay. It is actually 100% Chardonnay. I'm gonna bring this up for you to take a look at. This is the recipe that I sent out for you all to check out. This is a, um, a toffee crepe. So the filling's actually made with um, cream cheese, a little bit of, tiny bit of sugar, and you put a little bit of um, pecan sandies and a little bit of um, Keith Bar or Instrum's toffee in it. And then it's just topped by a little bit of toffee yeah. and san pecan sandies. We actually developed this recipe for Girl Scout cookies. There's a um, Girl Scout cookie that's a lot like a pecan sandy. I can't remember the name of it right now. Anyone know their Girl Scout cookies? But uh, this recipe is coming out to you. So I recommend this, something a little bit lighter than chocolate, but it will, it is actually got enough backbone, I think, to stand up to a chocolate dessert as well. I think so, yeah. I'm glad it's working for you. <laughs> peaches, Palisade peaches are a favorite with this. Yeah. Of course, of course. No, no, peonia peaches are even better. <laughs> okay, we'll call it, call, call it Western Colorado peaches. Western Colorado, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nancy, I have a couple of questions. One is um, if you know what the difference is between um, wine that's made from grapes, like you're talking about, that have gone almost to the raisin stage and, and versus grapes that have botrytis. And the other question is about this wine tasting sharing on trains with the AAA. Is that what I heard you say? So. <laughs> Great. Okay, so one step at a, one question at a time. 
So botrycized wines, um, it's often called the noble rot. We do have botrytis here in Colorado. However, because our climate is very, very dry, when the grapes are infected with botrytis, they tend to dry up instantly. They turn into a little raisin. So I don't think we will ever be able to make a botrycized wine like a Sauternes here in Colorado. Um, the effect of botrytis and the effect of making a, this is what we call a freezer wine or a cryo wine because it was frozen in the freezer to dewater it. And the effect that we get with the true ice wine where I freeze it on the vine, every single one of those processes is dewatering the grape. So in the case of botrytis, the mold impacts the skins of the grapes and desiccates them. And they're quite unattractive, I'm afraid. All those grapes in all of those processes, they start to get pretty ugly looking, but the juice that you get out of them is just magical. It's just amazing stuff. Um, you do start to get a little more of a, of a very ripe character, a little bit more, um, like I say, the best, my best description is really that you're moving from the flavor of a Thompson seedless grape to the flavor of a raisin. It's more of a, of a very ripe character. Um, if you smell this wine, I always like to do a fairly small glass. Um, that's one of the reasons I enjoy sharing this with friends because a little glass goes a long way. But you'll notice you're gonna get a lot of kind of honey and pear character, very ripe, rich flavors. Um, it has a heavy, you know, the heaviness of the sweetness, but it doesn't just lay on your tongue. It doesn't just hang out. And that's what gives you that, is coming from that balance of acidity that allows it to have enough brightness to go with foods nicely. So kind of, I get a lot of honey and pear. Um, it's hard to pick up classic varietal character of Chardonnay. It's such a different character to have that extra hang time and to have so much riper of a Chardonnay than you're gonna run into on a dry Chardonnay. Would you eat yeah. this, excuse me, <coughs> would you drink this with, with cheeses? I think it would go nicely with cheeses. I'd actually love to do it with a bit of a stinky blue. Something with some, some real richness and softness to it, um, kind of a creamy blue. Um, one of my favorite cheeses right now that I think it would go nicely with is Humboldt Fog, which comes out of California, Humboldt County, California. It's an amazing cheese. Has almost a little bit of a brie character. Um, yeah, that's, that's like a, a, a little dry, sort of, yeah. Yeah, so I think that would be a gorgeous pairing. I have a wine club customer who loves to do a peach pound cake with it. Um, I have a number of people that have marinated peaches in the wine or just poured peaches in wine over a little bit of ice cream, which is a lovely idea. Peach pie. Those are all, all great fun. So one, one of my impressions, and, and I may be totally wrong and totally off base with this, but back in oh, 2003, 2005, um, it, it appeared that the Grand Valley was trying to emulate Cal, uh, California. And there were California winemakers, there, were ca there was California influence into the Grand Valley. And what I'm, what I'm hearing from this series, from, from the Blue Sage and the, and the Palisade winemakers that have been part of it, and also from our West Elk AVA, is more of a direction to regionalization to we don't have to be like California we can be Colorado and and produce some very very nice wines it doesn't have to emulate the Cap Sauve it doesn't have to emulate the the the, the wines of California that uh, we need to be regional and again that appears to be another um, much more um, global view of wine, of, of having wine for the region. And so I'm curious whether it's uh, from, from Whitewater or Carlson, um, your, your view on trying to emulate Cal California wines or trying to be of our own region. I am 100% in agreement with your uh, analysis and, and I hope 
that more wineries will go that direction, but we're completely about tasting our fruit. Um, my husband, John, grows the grapes. Um, I like to tell people my job is not to, is to not mess them up. I want you to taste grapes. Um, I often taste a California wine and my immediate reaction is, well, gosh, that was a nice barrel. And I can't tell you anything about the grapes because they're completely overwhelmed by the immense amount of oak. Um, like Garrett, I use very little oak. Um, most of my wines are only in oak for 12 to 14 months and it's only usually about 20 or 30% new oak. I use a lot of neutral oak. Um, I like the, and this is again only in my reds. Um, like Garrett, I try to keep my price point attractive. Um, my semi-sweet wines are around 15. My reds tend to be right around 20 or a little over. And I'm aiming at those being a bottle of wine that you can have with dinner. And um, some of these wines, I, I think we, I mentioned in the video that the St. Vincent grape is a lot like a Sangiovese. You get these wonderful soft tannins and a lot of fruit. And they're the kind of wines you can really pair with meals. You know, you run into one of those huge monster calves that's just screaming with tannins. And, you know, you guys probably would have done pretty well with it tonight with your steak, but there's not a lot of other meals you can pair with that. You know, there's a lot of foods that um, people eat and that I enjoy eating that really cannot um, pair well with something that's just pretty much, you know, chewing on your beans there. <laughs> so I want you to taste the fruit. I, um, emphasize that and I'm glad that you're appreciating that and I hope you'll come and, and taste my other wines um, especially if you prefer more dry wines because I do make a lot of dry wines and we're thinking about them being food wines people are constantly commenting when I'm in the tasting room that I'm making them hungry because if you ask me which one of my wines is my favorite wine I'm going to ask you what's for dinner because to me, wines really are about food and they're about how the food and the wine are going to complement each other and work together. And so my favorite wine is completely dependent on what's, what's going in my mouth to pair with it. Um, you have a, a great variety of wines that you're making. How big is your, how big is your operation? I mean, um, it's like you're managing quite a variety. Yeah, you're, you're talking about my husband's over there rolling his eyes at me because we do a lot of really little batches and it's a lot of work. Um, it takes sometimes about as much work to make a 180 gallon tank as it does to make a 550 gallon tank of the same wine. And I make a lot, lots of little batches. I'm at about 20 different wines, um, but we're only at about 2000 cases a year. Um, a lot of my wines I don't distribute. I do a little bit of distribution over to Colorado Springs, Denver, and Fort Collins area, but I'm not widely distributed. We're mostly sold out of the tasting room or at local shops here in the, in the Grand Valley, a few restaurants. So it's, it's a lot of work, but you know, when, when you think about trying to restrict the number of wines, um, I've, I've played around with ideas of restricting the number that we do during tastings. Um, but, but then people don't have a chance to learn something new, to run into something that they're gonna fall in love with. So we keep the, the pores really small and give people an opportunity to try things. And when they walk out with a case, a lot of times there's nine different wines. Sometimes people buy every single wine I've got. I've got 20 different wines. I've had people walk out with a couple of cases and you know they doubled up on a couple of wines in it and bought one of everything that I make and that's that's a lovely compliment I mean that that they're enjoying my style and that they think that um, those different wines will go a lot with a lot of the different foods that they enjoy we've, we've been having such a delightful time doing the outdoor tastings this summer and we really get a chance to visit with folks when they're settled in at a table and they've been enjoying chatting with the people at the next table and not having to worry about you know where people are zooming around to and um, they can just have their own little space but still have a chance to visit a little bit. It's, it's been a, a really fun time. I think we'll continue with the outdoor tastings next year. Yeah. Great. I should go back for a second. I missed that other question um, about the wine trains. The um, AAA folks put on well, one year there were five wine trains. Um, most years they do three and they bring people over from 
Denver, um, they have some sort of a get together in the morning and like a wine 101 class on the train. And then um, the Grand Junction Visitor Center brings two winemakers up to um, Glenwood Springs. And it's for a number of years, it's usually been Carlson and us. So the, the, our two wineries um, um, have always just really enjoyed bragging about each other and working together. And we pour four wines on the train on the, the run from Glenwood Springs down to um, Grand Junction. And then the AAA folks bring them around the valley and we do little food and wine pairings. Um, AAA pitches in a little mud, money so we can have some food for them. And we get a chance to visit with them in the tasting room as well. So it's a really neat, neat trip that a lot of folks go on. And we're, we've all gotten really good at, at pouring, pouring while you're waving along like this. It's quite a, quite a, uh, different sort of a skill to acquire. Thanks for filling us in on that. Any other questions about this wine or about any of the other wines that we make? Well, um, Nancy, I would like to know, so um, how when, Okay, um, how do you decide what is your next wine that you're gonna make? You say that you have 20 wines now. How do you decide that? Most of my lineup of wines has kind of grown organically over a number of years. And then each year we try to produce that same wine and make it in the same style so that um, if you're purchasing that wine, if you fall in love with my Riesling or if you fall in love with my Merlot, the next year when you pick it up, you're not gonna be disappointed. You're gonna get a similar style. So I try to, to as much as possible match that style. Um, we do come up with um, some new wines occasionally. I um, recently introduced the St. Vincent and the Chamberson. They are both cold hardy varieties. And that was in response to some of the cold winters that we had in 13 and 14. Um, we had a lot of, of winter damage and we're going to have winter damage again this year. So we were looking for some varieties that were more um, cold tolerant. And so that's worked out well. We're looking right now like we'll probably have crops on those varieties. Um, we have a muscat variety called Aramella planted as well that we can blend with our muscat and that is a little more cold tolerant. So if the muscat crop comes in a little shorter, the Aramella percentage in our Moscato wine will be a little higher. So it just gives us a little bit more flexibility. And those grapes were chosen. My husband actually spent a lot of time and energy finding varieties that um, have the cold tolerance, but still have a very European character. That's why we're getting that very kind of Sangiovese, you know, Pinot Noir-ish kind of character. They're actually wonderful food wines as well because the um, tannin level is very low on them. And because we get them very ripe here in the Grand Valley, we can bring the acid down very well. So they make amazing food wines. They have very soft, silky textures, lots of rich fruit, and not a lot of those really harsh zingy tannins that some folks have a really tough time tolerating. So you know, um, I decided the only other wine I've made recently, something that I love and wanted to make, and also something that is um, a very popular product um, on the market right now that I just introduced is my dry rosé. And St. Vincent makes an amazing dry rosé. I like to make my rosés a little bit more red because I don't want my rosé to be a, a white wine that you have to pair with white wine foods. I want it to be the in-between wine that you can pair with salmon or ham or dark meat on a turkey leg or something like that. So this wine has the body to stand up to those interesting foods, but lots of nice bright acidity, beautiful kind of strawberry and berry characters. It's a fabulous dry rosé and I drink it all the time. <laughs> it keeps following me home. So that was something that I really wanted to come out with. So I drove my husband crazy and created yet another label. Nancy, I have a question. Um, Go ahead. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm just loving how knowledgeable you are, not only with food pairings, but also all the wines you're making. And how did you um, get involved in this in the beginning? Uh, well, my husband and I are both runaway computer geeks. Uh, John's an electrical engineer and I'm a software engineer. 
And we thought it was, we were actually involved in the wine industry before we moved here. We lived in Boulder and had been to some wine tasting events there and started traveling out here and um, going to the wineries. I started, we joined uh, what was called RMAVV at that point in time, the Vintners Association. And I would run the poster booth at Winefest um, as a volunteer, even before we moved here. And we thought, well, maybe we'll buy a piece of property and someday move out there. And then the piece of property that we found that we liked had a vineyard, which turned out to be in very rough shape and an almost brand new house on it. So we both told our bosses we were moving to Grand Junction with our computers and they all went, okay. So we were doing the COVID thing and telecommuting from Grand Junction, you know, in 1998. And we would um, drive over about every three weeks to visit the office and we telecommuted for a number of years. And we decided after growing grapes for a few years to start the winery, we had purchased the property over on 32 Road where the winery is located. So I got the winemaking job because John was already very busy with the vineyard. So that's kind of how we got started on all that process. By that point in time, um, both of us had gone ahead and stopped doing our high tech jobs and were working full time on the vineyard and the winery. I also, um, during those years, was running the um, education um, program for RMAVV. So I'd bring, help bring speakers in and set up um, seminars. And I actually am still on the education committee. They, they just had a VINCO, our big education, um, this year done, done virtually. But we bring a lot of different speakers in and also do a number of other kind of one-day seminars during the year. So I've been involved in that for, you know, going on 20 years here. Um, I learn new things every day. I'm always looking something up. People will mention something in the tasting room and we'll research it together. We'll pull out the wine encyclopedia and look things up. So it's an ongoing process, but it's, it's always fun. Well, thank I you. I have a question. Is um, just in the last several weeks that we've been doing this there have been several the who expressed sort of the same thing i learned it because i have a passion for wine is there i guess you you don't need to be certified or anything anybody can um with perseverance and good taste um anyone can uh set up a barrel and crush grapes up, yeah <laughs> is that true That's, yeah I, I call us kind of we're kind of out of control home winemakers but yeah. it does help. But, I mean, are you, you um, does, I guess from a liquor licensing point of view, the state must have some kind of um, oversight, no or no? Um, no, actually you can get a liquor license. You just have to, you know, follow all of their rules about tracking alcohol. Um, there are mm -hmm. some certain things that you cannot do with your wine. You know, if you have too high levels of VA or things like that, mm -hmm. those wines are, are not permitted to be marketed. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, we're, we're engineers and, you know, we read up on it and we kind of know what we're trying to do and we investigate it. A lot mm -hmm. of winemaking is, it's lots of cleaning and lots of attention to detail. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of engineering mentality where you have a lot of attention to keeping up with things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we always wish we had more time to keep up with things even better than we do. But, um, um, that's really the key to it. I mean, you have to protect those wines from oxygen. The, the barrels have to be topped. The tanks have to be gassed. Mm -hmm. And if you don't keep up with those things, you're not going to be able to keep your wines in great shape. Um, our particular philosophy um, is to try to get the wines ready to, to get into the bottle as quickly as possible. So we have just spent um, six days out of the last week and a half bottling. Um, our bottling line's pretty manual. Three people do about 40, 35 or 40 cases an hour. And we've just bottled 1500 cases. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's, it's a lot of work. Everybody lifts a couple of tons every day, one bottle at a time. And so that's all of the whites and the tank wines from last fall and all of the reds from last year. So the reds, almost all the reds, I still have a couple more reds to go. Um, and then our, our Oki Chardonnay. So we're getting really close, um, but we pull the wines out of barrel, put the new wines back into barrel, do all of our blending, get all the filtration done, get all the stabilization done that we need to do, all the testing done. And we try and get all of our bottling done at this time of year. So the wines don't have a chance to potentially get exposed to oxygen or anything like that. 
Um, and we're trying to keep all those beautiful aromatics and beautiful flavors by getting them safe as quickly as possible. So uh, Nancy, Katie, Caitlin, Casey, or Casey, Casey. and Caitlin um, from, from the North Fork Valley propose that we continue to work together, that we are the Western Slope, we are a region of Colorado and um, we can all make beautiful wine that reflects our terroir. And uh, thank, you, thank you so much for sharing what you have. And um, you know, the extent to which we can work together on Western Colorado is that we will all be successful. Absolutely. I just have to tell you, along that theme, I mentioned that I sell grapes to a number of wineries around the state. Mm -hmm. And yep. Um, yep. about six years ago, my Shiraz was in the Governor's Cup case of the top 12 wines in the state. The following year, um, my Shiraz, which I sold to, um, I have a number of people who purchase it. It was purchased by a winery up in Minturn called Monk's Hood Cellars and his Shiraz was in the Governor's Cup. And then, um, I think two years after that, Katori purchased some Shiraz from me and their wine was in the Governor's Cup. This was 19, I think. And he won the Governor's Cup um, best wine in the state that year. And he was kind enough to, Kyle was telling everybody that he'd gotten the grapes from us. And I had my, my Moscato in there that year, but everybody kept walking up to me and saying, congratulations. And I was like, well, I didn't win the cup. And they're like, yeah, but Kyle's bragging you up. So we love working with folks down there. Um, we always love sending folks your direction. And uh, we're, we, we feel that, that we're, we're definitely a, a family over here. And what, what works for some of us works for all of us. Yeah, uh, I, I, so I, one thing that I'm struck by both um, of the vineyards tonight, of the vintners tonight, is that is the number of different wines that each of you produces. I mean, um, Nancy, I think you said it's upward of 20 different varieties. And um, I, I, I'm not aware, I, I mean, in, in, for example, um, I, I I've never heard of that before, say, for example, certainly out here on the, no on the North Fork. We're in New York. We live way. in New York and, and, and on the North Fork of Long Island here, which is a, an AVA, I I'm assume, that produces a number of very interesting wines. I, I've never been to a winery there where they have had such a, a broad array of, of, of wines. Uh, is that typical of um, uh, wineries and are they just not showing those or I mean is that unusual to that area what what would you say about that or what would either of you say about that there we go um, well I'll start oh, Kaylin's yeah we lost Garrett um but so our number of varieties is part of his learning curve um <laughs> <laughs> what is he makes what we've been making and then he does an experiment um, mm. so some of these are just different sweetness levels of the same grape varietal so we have um, Gewürztraminer um, so we have a dry Gewürztraminer a semi-sweet Gewürztraminer and a sweet version of that so it's using that same grape but in different ways um, and just see what people like and what we like um, we have the same with the Riesling we have a semi-sweet Riesling, and then we have a dry Riesling. Um, a lot of them are taking also what we have left from a 100% varietal and then making a blend out of it. So trying to play on what the Valley does well um, and blending it together to make something even better. So it's kind of taking, you know, adding a little salt, adding a little pepper and figuring out what's, how can we make food even better. Um, so playing with blends has been a big thing. Um, some of it's out of necessity. Um, so when we are not able to get as many cases, we went starting to look at those cold hardy varietals that maybe people don't know much about or haven't heard much about or don't have the name that sells itself and then making something delicious out of those two. Um, so I think a lot of it is for us anyways is Garrett and likes to play. 
letting him play within limits. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also know that other people have different experiences. So Nancy, if you have something you'd like to add to that, I like to blame Garrett. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we can all blame Garrett for everything. <laughs> <don't we? laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, it, it is a lot of the things that you've seen, you know, I've had, um, there was one year I had a very small batch of Viognier and a very small batch of Muscat. And so I'm like, this is not worth dealing with. And I blended them all into one wine and I still have people walking in the door looking for that wine. I only made it one time. Um, so it's hard to let something go when somebody falls in love with it. But one other thing I'll point out, um, the wine industry actually has a very um, unfortunate habit. It's been brought up this evening also of marketing to a very small, very elite group of people. So there's, there's some really horrifying statistics that something like 95% of the wine is, is purchased by like 5% of the people or something like that. So the wines that have historically been made um, here in the US are being made and targeted at a very, very small group of people. We're a tourism industry here. We're running into a lot of entry-level wine drinkers, introducing people into wine for the first time in their lives. Um, some people think that, oh gosh, everyone's gonna grow up and learn to like wine and learn to like dry wines. And I can guarantee you that after spending 17 years talking to people in the tasting room, there's a whole lot of people in this world that are never gonna taste through a tannin. They can't <laughs> stand tannins. They will never be able to drink a tannin. And my mother-in-law is one of them. She tried to drink dry wine that was all my father-in-law bought for 60 years. And we brought her here to, to Colorado and took her to Carlson Vineyards. Her, she, her maiden name was Carlson. And she goes, finally, wines I like. So what we're doing here in Colorado is um, there's no reason in the world you can't make an amazing and an incredible semi-sweet wine. Um, the aromatics of our wines here at this high elevation with our high UV are just world-class. I mean, amazing fruit flavors, amazing aromas. And so we make wines that are the best wines we can make with those grapes. And when people come in and taste them, you know, we're creating new wine drinkers. We're taking people every day that walk into our tasting rooms and say, I don't really like wine. And they walk out with a whole bunch of bottles because they found that there was actually something that spoke to them um, that was different from what they could run into in their liquor store. Because everybody in the liquor store is always trying to sell you a big oaky Chardonnay or a super, super tannic oaky cab. And when you give people other options and start getting them thinking about foods and let people who like something sweet drink something sweet, then they find their happy place. A lot of the people who come in say, oh, I only like dry whites or I only like semi-sweets and they're not gonna start on, I, I mean, I have six dry, seven dry reds. They skip through all of those and start off with my rosé. They wanna go to the first sweet wine I have. And so a lot of people only taste a portion of, of the wines. Um, I had somebody come in one day and she says, I like sweet. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna start you off with zero below. And she tasted it and she looked at me, and she said, not sweet enough. Oh said, <laughs> Let's try the ice wine. And she tasted that and she looked at me and she said, not sweet enough. Oh. I said, okay, I'm not gonna be able to help you out. <laughs> But she was honest about what she liked. She was looking for what she liked. And because we get people from so many places with so many different palates, and because we're educating so many entry-level wine drinkers, um, we're not marketing to that 5%. We're trying yeah, to market so it's, to yeah, so it's not a It's not a mass market. It's not mass market driven as it is, say, in California, where you know, where there are all these big labels and they're selling into that market, you have a little more flexibility that way. Both of you have said that, that in your own, each in your own way, you know, you've got a husband who likes to play and you've got a clientele who likes to come in and, 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 and drives you to play and experiment. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's very enlightening. Thank you. Yeah. I so, can see Caleb, yeah, Casey he's sitting the there nodding. I have a question. Oh, you know, I'm 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 German, and I grew up in Germany, and and all the wines 
which came from the Moselle, the Rhine, the Main River, they were all they were all tied to a certain region or to a certain uh, yeah region. So you could not do any blending. Now, what amazes me here in this country, and then you and and the the other uh, ladies, you were talking about blending. You. Here's my question. Do you manipulate the taste or do you listen to the customers who want to buy your wine? Because to me, it is a, uh, well, I, I just, maybe I'm too old for it, but, but uh, it, it, it needs some more explanation because what you do is you just, you just move around, you buy wine and you use your own wine. You, 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 you you, you are expert in blending and, and listen to the taste of the potential customers, or you try to, to tell the customers what they like, what they should have. So that, it, it, it bothers me. Yeah, um, I'll start and then uh, we'll see what, what Kaylin and, and Casey want to say on that too. Um, the answer is yes, we do all of the above. Um, my wines are all 100% Grand Valley grown um, of my 20, to 21 labels that I have, all but two of them are state grown. So uh, but regionally, they're all coming from the same region. I do some blending. Um, it's in the great tradition of Europe, of course, and that Bordeaux um, allows um, um, blending and they have five reds that are in the blend and there's no particular rule about how they're blended, but they just have to stay within those five reds. And I think there's three whites, what's, um, Simeon Sauv Blanc, um, I'm not sure about the whites. Um, obviously they have different rules in different regions in Burgundy and France, you know, it's Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, but our objective is really to make the best possible wines. We do varietal wines. Um, the labeling in the US allows for blending um, of up to 25% of another variety um, if you do a varietal label. Most of the time, mine are 100%, but if I, have, if I have a wine that's sort of boring and one dimensional, I might play around with doing a little bit of blending and I might put five, 10, 15% of a different variety in it to make it be a better wine. Um, because I'm not actually all about, like you say, it's, it's very neat that we don't have strict rules, that we are able to experiment and um, play around and try and make the best possible wines. So, um, it's within this, the regulations of the U.S. to do the varietal wine. And so if something, Cabernet Franc's a classic, sometimes it's very one-dimensional. Uh, the last couple of years with some of our hot summers, I have not had to do any blending with Cabernet Franc, but sometimes Cabernet Franc's kind of a one-note wonder. And if you put, you know, say 10% Merlot in there to just kind of give it a little extra personality, it improves the wine. And so I'm not here to make, to follow a recipe and say, oh, I have to do this exactly that way. I'm here to try and make something that I think is really fun and really interesting and really complex. And we play around, my ethereal is a blend that I taste through the barrels every year and I'm looking for the barrels where magic happened. You know, um, even if you have the same cooper and the same wine in it, sometimes you taste a certain barrel and you're just like, wow, this is just so amazing. And then we get our graduated cylinders out and do our little mad scientist thing and play around with blends, kind of like Garrett dumping the five glasses in front of the crew in the morning and make a big mess in the lab. And then we pick out a couple favorite blends and taste them again a couple days later and we blend those together. So we have the 100% wines, um, we have the most mostly wines and we have deliberate blends where we're just looking to just create um, lots of beauty and complexity. And so it's kind of neat that we're not heavily regulated in that area, that we can experiment and learn. Um, the fact that we're in a very challenging climate and we can work with some cold hardy varieties that are just really fun and spectacular wines. They're now some of my best selling wines. People taste them and they're just blown away by them. They're like, how come I haven't heard about this grape before? And if we were heavily regulated as to what we could grow, we wouldn't be able to learn about those things. So I think we kind of have the best of all worlds and that we can um, can do all of the above. Yeah, uh, Nancy, I think that, that states it very, very well. Um, and one of the things about Western Colorado, uh, I mean, we, we have some uniqueness about the things that grow here. 
Um, our vegetables are highly mineralized. Um, uh, the, the, the really wonderful food that comes here, the, the, the beef, the bison, the, you, you know, it, it's, yes, um, right. <laughs> and, and the wines should reflect that and should reflect the cuisine of the region. And uh, to tinker with it too much would, would make it, you know, okay, maybe you can emulate ca uh, California, but does that really just define the region of Colorado? And, and I really appreciate uh, winemakers who are not just, um, um, well, I'm gonna say this, prostituting themselves to the Colorado or to the California Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Chardonnay, but, um, but really try to reflect the terroir, try to reflect the region and try to reflect what we are, who we are. Mm -hmm. And and so winemakers like yourself that that are in tune to that, um, I think, may, you know, ultimately and eventually bring us a, a very strong branding and a very strong mm -hmm. um, association to the land that we love. Well, I, I don't know whether I should agree with it because it seems to me if you, it's, it's really the label what counts. What makes the big difference between Colorado wine and California wine? Because you both do the blending and to, to, the, to try to cater to the taste of the, of the customers. And that's what troubles me because there should be something very specific, very special for Colorado wines. But I cannot, maybe, maybe my taste bud is not, not good enough to, to recognize it. You know what I tried to yeah, say? Um, Colorado's got a, a lot. I actually, uh, we snicker a lot at California. Um, I, I, I like to drink wines from everywhere in the world. Um, I yeah. drink a lot of Italian and Spanish wines, um, you know, um, dry German wines. I, I tend to be a dry wine drinker. And so I've tried to keep my palate eclectic and learn about wines from everywhere. Like I say, you know, obviously um, Bordeaux's the classic example. That's the, actually California with their, when they blend wines, they do a lot of what they call meritages and they're um, imitating Bordeaux. So California, you know, a lot of what California does is what they learned or saw from France. Um, and so they, they also do both, you know, they do 100% varietal wines and they do blending. So they do a little of everything too. Um, the advantage that we have here in the US is that we're allowed to do any of the above. Um, and in Europe, their, their regulations, those old regulations that are many hundreds of years old often um, specify what they're required to do. In France, they're actually required to pick on a certain day that somebody who's not even probably a grower will say, okay, today's the day you have to pick your grapes. Um, here we're allowed to, you know, I mean, look at our microclimates. I mean, I might pick my grapes and it'll be two or three weeks before somebody down in Palisade will pick the same variety. I'm a little bit higher up on the hill. I have a little more cold air drainage. Everything happens a little bit differently than 10 miles away from me. So I, I appreciate our flexibility. Um, and I think we do some of what they would do in, in Germany. Um, but we have the availability to do other things that they're not able to do. So, um, but uh, the only thing I was going to point out is that the other thing we snicker about about California is they brag a lot of times about high elevation grapes at 1,200 feet. I was just <laughs> going to say that yeah, we're at 4,600 feet and our high UV here, I think, is really one of the keys um, that makes Colorado unique. Um, People talk all the time about the spiciness and the beautiful aromas. And when you get those big, thick, heavy skins that are protecting our grapes from the sun at our high UV here, uh, it's just pretty magical. I mean, the, the flavors are remarkable. We get cool evenings during the fall when we're harvesting the grapes, beautiful acidity levels because we have such a condensed short growing season. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty unique terroir that we have here. And, and I think expressing that and and trying to be true to where we're at is, is what we really need to do. Yeah. So Nancy, Kaylin, uh, Casey, and Garrett remotely, uh, thank you, even though we may not be finished, for sharing your creativity, your intelligence, your passion, and your love of what you do. 
Thank with you. us. Thanks for joining us. It's been a delight to talk to everyone. Thank and you. also, I'd like, I'd like to say I want to thank Blue Sage for allowing me to record uh, Whitewater and uh, Carlson. Um, it was a joy. Um, uh, both of you guys are terrific uh, ambassadors, if you will, for uh, the wineries or the wine region of Western Colorado. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I'd like to say thank you. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Very nice. Before we go, Nancy, when I want to buy my friends a special wine from Colorado, something that's a little different, I buy them zero below. And everybody loves it. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. A intense, but it, um, great wine. And I'm a big red person, and I really enjoy it. So thank you. Lovely. It's a fun treat. It's fun to introduce folks to something new and different. So I was delighted that you request, requested that one. It's a fun wine to introduce folks to. Any other questions? It's been a delight to talk to everyone. I appreciate you including us. It's been fun to work with everyone and uh, you all have done a fabulous job of putting all this together with all your videos and the Zoom. I've, I've watched, watched the one last week. I wasn't able to catch any of the others, but I'll try and catch as many as I can. It's great fun to, to hear all the information from everyone. So really got one more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Yeah. Whitewater and Carlson, thank you so much. It was great. I mean, we're just, I'm loving these wine adventures and we only have one more week left. So thank you and we will see everyone next Friday night.